Hello, art historians, and welcome to our last lecture over um, Greek art. And when we last left our story, we were talking about how the Parthenon really reflected those, and the architectural design really reflected those um, Greek belief systems of humanism and rationalism, and that everything can have perfect order and balance through mathematical symmetry. And just before we move on into high classical, because, um, or excuse me, we were in high classical, we're going to move into late classical, I do want to mention with the Agora, and the Acropolis, how this is a really good example of how works of art that we're gonna talk about often change over time in terms of their functions. So eventually um, Greece is gonna be conquered by the Romans. And so whenever um, Constantine decided, so we're gonna talk about this later in Rome, but one of the emperors, Constantine, decided to adopt Christianity on his deathbed, but also before that he legalized the religion because it was basically telling, tearing Rome in half. Um, this religious rift. And again, we'll talk more about that in Rome. Um, they decided that this was, if you're going to be Christian, you have to be all in. So by taking over Greece, you have this great temple to these pagan gods. So what we start to see happen is that these pagan images of things like Athena and the temples that were for her, they were destroyed. And a lot of the um, sculptures were taken down and removed because you're trying to get rid of that pagan um, polytheistic worship. And after that, the Parthenon actually became a church, which was very common in Rome, the Pantheon that we're going to talk about, which was originally built to all gods in the empire and um, became the oldest Christian church or Catholic church in Rome. And then later, when Greece is conquered by the Ottoman Empire and the, the people who took it over were the Turks and they were Islam or Islamic, they came in and conquered this area and therefore the Parthenon was no longer a church. It was going to become a mosque, which this is also going to happen to the Hagia Sophia in the Byzantine Empire, one of the greatest churches that was built there. So later on, the Greeks are going to obviously reclaim this area, which is why they have a huge problem with the Elgin marbles um, being gone, is because they were like, you gave them away when we were controlled by the Ottomans and not by us. So you took something that was ours without asking us, and the fact that they were given to you by the Ottomans isn't really fair. So after high classical, now anytime you hear of a high point in art, so like eventually we'll talk about the high renaissance, the high point generally doesn't last very long. It's usually a very short period of time because the high point is when the standards of perfection are established. And we saw that with the spear bearers. So like during the you know high classical period in Greece where it becomes this is the you know idea that we're going to follow and this is the art that follows it and that everything should be about perfection and balance and order. After that establishing of the rules, there's really only one way to go, and that's to start to break them. So high Renaissance, high classical, those time periods don't usually last very long because of, if you keep doing that, then all you're basically doing is copying someone else's work without adding any individualism. And that's kind of a new idea that started to pop up in Greece is this idea of the individual, which was going to happen because they'd been very civic and community minded and that everything was for the good of Athens and for the state. But now that this period of war is over, it starts to become this idea of the individual and the us. And part of this is going to come from the fact that Greece, Athens and Sparta in particular are going to get involved in what's called the Peloponnesian War, which is a civil war that I mentioned in the context where they're going to start fighting against each other. And kind of those ideals started to slip a little bit because when you're in the middle of war, those civic values and rationality are gonna kind of go out the window. So as we start to see the rise of like heroes again during this war and that you know people were fighting for different reasons, we see individualism become this new big idea and individuals feel emotions. This time in Greece was hard, like it was rough. And they fought some really tough battles and went through, through some really difficult things. They went through a civil war. They were taken over by the Macedonian. So that's Philip II and later his son, Alexander the Great. And during this late classical time period, they start to lose those ideas of civic, about that idea of perfection that we should all strive to be. And instead, it becomes more focused on not what we could be, but celebrating who we are instead. 
Because now people in this this empire united together under Macedonia, they're not all just Athens and they're not all just Sparta. They're all individual city states and individual people. So we start to see this push towards individual identity and individuals. What makes them unique is not how they look necessarily, um, because people can look the same, but it's their feelings and their individual soul that is unique. So in the late classical period, we start to see more emotion. We start to see more individuality and people that idealism is still there, but it starts to change a little bit. So we look here at the grave stela of Hegeso. And so this is actually really interesting because we see something happening here. This is a grave stela marking the grave of an individual person and a woman at that, which is kind of different because women in Athens weren't really valued all that much. And if you look at this, we start to see kind of the influence of what would be modern headstones or grave markers where, you know, it has the birth and the death dates and, you know, wife of, son of, daughter of, husband of, you know, and it starts to become more about the individual because during the time when Greece was very civic minded and everything was about all of us together, you didn't have gravestones like this. Like basically we went the Koro statue, which was a grave marker. And then for a while, we don't really have much of grave markers at all. In fact, most of the time, it's just cremation for the Greeks. But now, all of a sudden, as individualism becomes the new um, idea, we see the art reflecting that. And this is a headstone, basically, for an individual woman. Um, and again, we haven't seen this really since the Archaic period. However, this is after the creation of the Parthenon. So we see a little bit of pop culture at the time where people are like, oh, if the Parthenon and the sculpture and the art there was the style or the architecture, we wanna mimic that to show that we're hip with the time. So if you look at this right here, you can see on the sides, this Doric columns on the side, you can see the pediment, the triangle up at the top. You can see that used to be written across here was her name and who she was. And you can see that she's got that wet drapery look to her, which would have been the hot style since Phidias used it on the Parthenon. So we think that this is cool, yes, um, because we are seeing a little bit of individualism. We're also seeing something now called high relief, all right? This is no longer a bas relief, like where it's just kind of shallow cut into, like shallow braille, like you could feel it. This is high relief because we really see that it's deeply cut in and the reason for that is it's even more to make this look naturalistic so kind of this effort now to oh my gosh this fly sorry sorry guys this effort even more to create not so much idealism anymore but a little bit more realism so if you put the r's together we're returning to naturalistic realism because what the high relief could do, if you look at this, if you look down here at the bottom of the chair, you can see shadow and you can see shading and it looks like a real scene. And that's kind of what they were going for is to make this look even more realistic. Now, what is showing about this time is we think, oh, cool, this was for a woman. Well, not exactly. Um, she's shown inside a home, so a domestic sphere. She is actually being brought her jewels, so kind of showing that like she's a princess. She's being, you know, given her jewels by a servant. But it also across the top identifies her not as who she was individually, but as the daughter of this guy. So like basically she's not enough in her own right. She has to be honored because she's the daughter of this. But we can see that individualism happening and we can see that they're starting to move away from that idealism, like the Parthenon and the spear bearer that's so perfect, it's not even possible, and now starting to move towards realism that's a little bit more natural with that high relief. Just to give you guys kind of an idea of how this actually looks here. So you don't have to know these for the 250, but I'm kind of showing you a little bit how we are like especially under alexander the great as he expands the empire out we start to see the art really become a lot more naturalistic realism that 
yes, there is still kind of that ideal, like this is how you should look, but it's a lot more naturalistic in terms of how they are acting. Um, so for example, here is Hermes interacting with the baby Dionysus. And instead of looking off into the distance, he's grounded and he's here and he's interacting with the baby. And he would have been dangling grapes like for the baby to play with. In late classical, we also see the start of female nudity. So this is Aphrodite of Nidos. So Aphrodite is obviously a goddess, as you know. And in Greece, it would have been completely uncalled for to show a woman nude, especially a goddess. However, this is a time when Greek art and architecture has spread out with Alexander the Great as he conquers Egypt and Persia and Mesopotamia and moves towards India. To those places, Aphrodite is not a big deal. She's just a goddess. So for them to show her nude would not be a big deal. And if she's the ideal beauty, then why not show that off? Now, they always did a really good job of making the nudity for females much more justifiable. So for example, she's modest, she's covering herself, and she's always holding um, or nearby, there's kind of some drapery, which again, there's that wet drapery influence but it looks like she would have been nude for a purpose. Like she's taking um, off her robe to go take a bath or maybe she was just wearing it, but it's not just nudity for the sake of admiring the body. So things to look at for high classical is we start to see very much um, natural realism. So we're starting to move back towards that naturalism a little bit. So you would see female nudity you see the, the positions that they're in are much more relaxed and it's almost like you're being honored now, not for how you look, but for what you're doing and how you look doing it. So for example, this is called the scraper. And I know it looks like he's pointing at you, but he's actually not. He would have been after wrestling or working out, they would cover themselves in oil so they're slippery while they're wrestling. And then they would take a scraper and like scrape that oil off. So it's kind of what he's doing. But it's not just that he's awesome because he looks like this. It's because of what he's doing, that he's an awesome wrestler now. Then, after Alexander the Great dies, all right, and Greece kind of becomes in chaos a little bit, people start to kind of go their own direction with Greek art, all right? And we start to see, after Alexander the Great, we see what's called Hellenism. And what Hellenistic art is, it's Greek art mingled in with other cultures, right? And during this time, we see this Greek art become much more, much more naturalistic, much more um, down to earth in terms of what's happening, especially this idea of capturing not only the physical self, but the emotional self. So Hellenistic art takes place after Alexander dies. And what we start to see really happening is this mix of Greek art, and really it's a Greek a mix of ideas that re were reflected in the art. So Greek art mixing in with Egyptian and Indian and Persian, and just kind of this idea that they don't hold the same standards of perfection as the Greeks did, but they may like Greek art kind of mingled in with their own way of showing it. So perfection at this point and idealism in Greek art kind of going out the window, okay? Yes, you can still look really, really good, but now it's about, I need to capture the emotion that people are feeling and what they are going through in a way that makes other people feel it. So it's not now just about the work of art, it's meant to include the viewer. Like Hellenistic art comes into your space. Like it's very three-dimensional, like, in this one, you look, their, their knees are out and like they're coming into your space. Like it's very dramatic and over the top. Um, Hellenistic art was generally meant to be seen from all different views. So that way you could get a true picture of the entire scene. And they wanted to make you feel something because not everybody thinks the same way that the Greeks do. Like they don't have the same ideas, but emotions are universal. Like there's sadness, there's fear. That's something that if you take a work of art, they may not all understand what the artist was going for, but they can understand the emotions that come with it. And in an empire this big after Alexander the Great, they may not get the same Greek ideas of perfection, but they get that human emotion 
They may not understand the idea of humanism, but they understand humans. So this is ideas that all people can relate to, like death or sadness or defeat and getting not only the subject or the content to show that, but to get the person watching it to view that. So for example, the Nike of Samothrace, all right, was supposed to be very inspiring. Now, what about this is still Greek? Well, clearly it's got that wet drapery look. It's got the fittiest touch to it, but it's twisting, right? It's moving. It's, it's almost like a moment, a snapshot in time. It's very dramatic. Like she just landed on the front of a boat. And that's what it was meant to look like is that this Nike of Samothrace has landed on the front of this boat and it would have been this hole of a boat that she would be standing on like marble and then a fountain in front of it like it's supposed to be this whole dramatic experience of the water splashing up on her like she landed on this boat and led them to victory so the twisting of this the movement is what makes you feel that wow this is a powerful moment it's not meant to be just admired it's meant to be felt Right, and that was entirely the point of this. Now, the one they picked for you guys for the 250 is the seated boxer. And I think that the seated boxer is perfect for this. Well, number one, it's done in bronze, which is the traditional medium that the Greeks liked to use because the bronze could be polished to be reflective. So kind of be like very realistic, like sweat or to show like the sun glistening off the muscles. So we have in this case, Le I mean, the ideal body is still there, but the emotion is very, very naturalistic. So if you look at the seated boxer's face, he's sitting down, he's exhausted. Now the Greeks are all about athleticism and perfection. We saw that with the discus thrower, but this celebrates athleticism in an entirely different and much more naturalistic way. All right, so you're looking at a guy who has just gotten done fighting, and we know this because they took his knuckles, and his, you can see his fists are wrapped for fighting in boxing gloves, and he's got on his knuckles, they put copper, which would look like against the bronze, it would look like cuts and like blood. And this guy is bent over and he's tired. He's like, oh my God, this is exhausting. And to them, this was an idea that everybody could get to. That Greek idea of like the spear bearer of humanism, not everybody got, but they get this. Persia could get this, Egypt could get this, that this was a hard fight. So what this guy is doing makes him, even though he looks like it's tough, he looks more awesome. Sorry, my lights just went off in my classroom. You're gonna come back on. Sorry, thank you even though it looks like this was really tough and yeah, maybe he's been hurt, it makes it look so much more awesome that he did it. Like, wow, you did this really tough thing. And that really speaks to the awesomeness of humans in an entirely different way. It's taking that, not necessarily the humanistic perfection idea that the early Greeks had, but these statues made by people who may or may not have been Greek, they are getting that idea of humanity and that humans are tired and they get weak but the fact that he's doing this that he's choosing to fight and he's boxing makes it look even more awesome because it's difficult rather than the spear bearer the discus thrower which make it look super easy because to humans who are in perfect shape this should be easy but it makes boxing look even more powerful because this guy is tired and it was hard so kind of compare the two here, all right? So over here, do we have realism? Yes, realistically, we could see a guy throwing a discus. Is it natural? No, that pose isn't even natural. And nobody looks like that. And that pose is just not gonna happen. But over here, we also have realism because the Greeks were very much about down to earth, right? Does he still have an ideal body? Kind of, I mean, it's still there, but this is natural emotion, natural. This is tough, this is hard. This is how it would actually look. This is not a natural expression for somebody trying to hold this pose. It's not, have somebody try it and then look at their face and see if that looks easy. It's not, and plus they'll fall over on their face if they don't have something to lean against, trust me. But here we've got this guy that's like, that's natural. That's how somebody who just got done boxing would look. And it, the feeling and the emotion is very natural.
So where we can really see this Hellenistic style and what it's about is what we call the Pergamene style, all right? So Alexander the Great creates this massive empire, all right? He unites all the Greek people together except Sparta and uses those people to conquer Egypt, conquer Persia, conquer India to an extent, and then head back, all right? When he died, his empire, there just couldn't be another ruler like him. So his empire split up into three different places that were ruled by three different Greeks, so like generals of his, all right? After he died, Greece was kind of a mess. Like, they had been a mess before Alexander. They were kind of a mess, a mess afterwards. They weren't really united together. So we start to see other places become the center of Greek art, even if they aren't necessarily Greece. And Pergamon is a great example of that. This became the new center of Greek art. And these people were very into heroicism because these kings, who are not Greek, for the record, these kings had fought against some major enemies like the Gauls, who were German, right, which were a huge threat to them, these Germanic tribes. Um, so it's very important to them to show, like, everything we're doing is tough. It's not easy. It's really, really difficult, you know, and because we did it, it's an even, because it was tough, it's an even bigger achievement, all right, so it's an even bigger thing for them. So, for example, this work right here shows a Gaelic king, so a Gaul who looks like a Greek, but he's actually a Gaul, and you would know this because he's wearing, like, a choker around his neck that tells you that that's a Gaul. He's killing him and his wife rather than be defeated by the Greeks, which means why would you show your enemy like this? Why would you ever show the guy that you beat looking like this? And the whole idea was, well, if I beat just a little shrimp, what kind of victory did I have? But if I beat someone like this, that's pretty awesome. So it's really getting that emotion out of the viewer by showing naturalistic, even if the image is not I, you know, naturalistic, definitely the emotion and the experience is. So we can see this also with the dying gall, which is, you know, very big from Pergamon, that this guy he has fought and fought and fought and fought and fought. Like we can look on his face, like this was really, really rough. And he's wearing that torque, which is that choker that said he was, you know, from Gaul. And this guy has fought and he's fallen and the marble shows like the glistening of the sweat. You can see the wound right here um, where he got cut underneath like his rib cage. So probably like going into his lungs, he's struggling to breathe. And you were meant to look at this from every angle and see just how tough this was like, oh my gosh, this is exhausting because why show your enemy like this? Well, because if we beat a guy who fought this hard, what does that say about us? Again, does he look perfectly natural? No, still a little bit ideal, but the emotion is very, very naturalistic. So just to show you guys what we're talking about here in terms of this. This is a couple more Hellenistic images, and you guys can see here that you, they're still Greek. I mean, they've taken that wet drapery look, like that's still continuing on, but they're changing the way because these aren't Greeks all necessarily who are doing this. They're not going to follow that same idea of humanism, but they do like that human emotion piece that all people can feel. So the Pergamon altar is this wonderful example of a combination of classical Greek and Hellenism. So classical Greek is idealized perfection. Like it's not natural. People don't look like that. We saw that with the rational, like the ratios they had for the spear bearer, that this is how art should look and this is how people should look. And then even the Parthenon, not possibly perfect. I mean, it's it's meant to look perfect, but it's not. So we've got here in Hellenism, we have that naturalistic emotion and feeling, even if it's not natural in how it looks, all right? So this in Pergamon, if you guys look right here, Pergamon is in Turkey, all right? So greasy Turkey, all right? So Greece, Turkey. Pergamon is not in Greece, all right? But they do realize that they are drawing a parallel, that they're kind of the new Greece, basically. So what you see right here is this 
kind of idea that you saw from the Panathenaic frieze around the Parthenon that shows the procession of them preparing the peoplos and bringing it up to Athena. So they took that idea of the frieze and blew it up. And I mean that literally up to like 11 feet high, high relief friezes that you can see here around the base of it. And this is the Temple of Zeus, all right? So the idea of this, and if you look at it, it kind of looks like the propylae, right? Walking up to, now this is actually located in um, a museum in Berlin, or right? it's not obviously in its original context, and they've tried to put it together the best that they can. So you'd be walking up the propylae and you're like entering the world of Zeus. And around here, we have the gigantomachy, all right? So giganto, and they don't mean that just big because it is big, but it's this battle between the gods and the giants, okay? So like the Titans, giants, all right? So that's the scene that you are seeing around here is this battle between the gods and these Titans, all right? So the gods obviously win this, all right? So what you see here is the gods have defeated the Titans and they are dragging them up the steps to be judged by Zeus. And they are crawling onto the steps, like they're coming into your space. You're meant to feel pity for them. You're meant to view them as like, wow, these were mighty foes that the gods were beating. Look how strong they are. Look how hard they're fighting. The gods must have won one heck of a battle for this. But just like on the Parthenon, this is a little bit of a passive aggressive message because what this is actually for is it represents the king of Pergamon defeating the Gauls. So the Gauls are like the giants. Remember, they made the Gauls look like they were really tough and strong, just like they made the gods look really tough and strong. But then he comes and defeats this fierce opponent and then takes him to Zeus for judgment. So this basically, this freeze is like a giant metaphor, really. What's kind of scary about this is people used to think that it was Alexander's beating of the Persians was the metaphor. It's not. This was done way after Alexander. So could it have paralleled that? Yeah, but it's actually more for the Gauls being defeated by Pergamon. And again, what's really scary about this is that the Nazis actually used this building as inspiration for their Nazi parade grounds. So if you look here, right, this is the steps walking up to the Temple of Zeus. And this is that massive high relief freeze so that you can actually out of sculpture create shading and shadows and create even more depth and three dimension because they want it even more realistic so that you can really feel the drama and the emotion that it's twisting and turning and they're they've got some by the hair and they're dragging them up the steps and the titans are trying to hold on to the steps like don't drag me up to zeus and it's just the looks on their faces but man, the gods look buff and ideal and tough because it's like, we're going to keep that because it makes them look even tougher and we beat them. So take a look right here. You can see high classicism over here with the Parthenon, right? With that processional frieze of, you know, creating their, cre here's the fabric to create the peoplos for Athena. And then we have over here, the gigantomachy or gigantomachy or whatever you want to say. It's different ways I've heard it pronounced. But this is that, not only is it gigantic, so it's the giants fighting the titans, or excuse me, the gods, but this is like huge. It's 11 feet high. It's meant to make you feel small looking at it. And you can see this from all the angles, like how, because it's high relief, so you can see it from different views. So this is Athena from the Pergamon altar, right? And you can see here that there's a lot going on in this scene. So she has... One, and obviously her face has fallen off and you can't really see it, but she has one of the giants by the hair, all right? And she's got one hand back ready to smite him. Like she's, she's about to take him out. And over here is Nike with her wings coming to crown Athena to say, good job in your victory. So like Nike, like I bless you, great job. And then down here is the gods. And you know it's a woman because it's got that wet drapery look. Here she is with her hair blowing in the wind by the flapping of Nike's wings. Like it's a whole dramatic scene. And she's begging Athena not to kill her son. But Athena's like, too bad. That's what's going to happen anyway. Very. So does the guy's body still look like that Greek idealism? 
Yes, but they don't have that Greek idea of humanism that everything has to be perfect and composed. This is about that natural feeling and how this would naturally look so that it looks more like a really amazing feat. So this is a couple more images just so you can see it and how like these guys are all over the place. Like they are moving, they're twisting, they're turning so that you can see it from all sides and appreciate the entire scene. Look, here's one of the other gods about to smash this guy over the head. Like it's just very emotional, but that's natural emotion. And they wanted you to feel that because these people who aren't from Athens who are doing this Greek art somewhere else, they're all about the emotions that everybody can understand and get. And this, you know, Greek art was like an inside joke that you couldn't get. Everybody can get this. And just to show you guys, this is the Nazi parade grounds in Nuremberg, where you can see that they kind of stole that Pergamon altar, right? Which is really, really scary. Yeah, there it is. So what's really cool about this as we wrap up Greek art is you can see the ideas that the Greeks had and that those ideas didn't necessarily match with what people outside of Greece had. But because Greek art spread with Alexander the Great, we see them after Alexander dies and his empire has kind of been collapsed and Greece is no longer kind of the center of everything. We can see the ideas of those other areas change and impact the art as well, even though they continued stuff from classical Greece, like the wet drapery look or the ideal bodies. All right, so we are going to stop there. There is a um, personal progress check for you in um, my AP classroom, so you can kind of test and see how you're doing. Um, and if you have any questions over the material or any of the pieces, please let me know. Also remember that on your pack sheet, you need to be um, completing all of the pieces. You may not have gotten them all from a presentation, but you did get all of them from me. So you can incorporate that into your pack sheet.